I'm Kami Jason. This is the way I see it. Welcome to beautiful Seven Mile Beach, guys. We're just wrapping up a full day of diving here in the Cayman Islands, and man, have we got something in store for you guys today. I've been diving this week with Andre Musgrove. He's a rising superstar in the underwater photography world. He's from the Bahamas, and tonight we're gonna to be taking him into the studio, doing an interview, asking him some questions about his style, his camera housing, and anything else we can come up with. So when you're ready, let's go to the studio, meet up with Andre. Andre, thanks for coming out, man. I really no appreciate man. it. For those of you who don't know, this is Andre Musgrove. He is an amazing photographer visiting from the Bahamas, and we are very happy to have you here in Cayman. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So uh, we wanted to get you in today because the, our, our show, The Way I See It, has been basically filmed underwater, talking about camera settings, talking about underwater photography, talking about lighting, talking about videos, talking about housings, talking about everything underwater photography. Yeah. And today we wanted to mix it up because we got you on island and I want to pin you down on some different things and talk about uh, some of the things that we do similar and some of the things that we do differently. So okay. welcome to K-Man. So for those of you, for those people watching that, don't, that aren't familiar with your work, where are you from? How'd you get into it? Tell me a little bit about yourself. So I'm from Nassau, Bahamas, and I've gotten into underwater photography just through being around, well, living in the Bahamas. I grew up spear fishing and free diving with my dad, and I started with a GoPro, maybe like some other pe some other people also. And the GoPro was like my key to share my adventures to everybody else who wasn't there with me. And from there, straight out of high school, I started working at a dive shop that had a photo lab on underwater. Um, photography lab basically yeah. so every single day I'm out at that at that dive shop where we have cameras and that's why I learned how to shoot and so were you an instructor it, when you were working at that shop or was, no, this, was I went, this early on in your career this is like I went there as a rescue diver right. I did my open water my advance and my rescue in high school yeah yeah and then I did my dive master and my IDC there for instructor and I worked there for two years. And every single day was just underwater photography. Yeah. You, always have a, you always have a camera no matter where you dive, whether it's taking pictures of normal scuba divers, um, shark dives, the yeah. shark dive every day, free divers, other crazy stuff, whether it be like film shoots or underwater photo shoot type right. of stuff. But it was everything in between and you're shooting with the camera. Sure. So what got you into it? Was it the this is the job, they need, to, they need a shooter underwater, and then the passion grew from there. Were you pa did you shoot topside before you got into the, into the diving side of it? Um, not really, as I, was, I, was, I started from generally, like I, I used to take photos like in my yard with the norm, like a normal camera yeah, yeah. I used to have, just with automatic settings and all that stuff. Then I moved on to the GoPro where I was able to carry it underwater where my main activities were spear fishing or free diving when right. I did when I was younger. So I used that as a way to share the adventures when I come right. out of the water. And then the photo lab has always been there and I worked with some other people, some locals, some foreigners, since it's a dive shop, it's a frequent yeah. thing. And and that's how I that's how it basically started. I know right. I always love diving and I love sharing the experience and taking photos and stuff. So I just merged the two together and right. I'm doing what I'm doing now. When you got on the boat, I noticed straight away, I'm like, you are set up for video. And so tell me about these Keldan lights that you've got, because I shoot a very similar rig, but I, it's, it's very rare that I have camera envy. <laughs> when I saw those filters, man, I was like, I got camera envy. So tell us, what is this thing? How do you use it? And what is that filter on the top of it? All right, so these are the Caldan 8X CRI 96 8000 lumen lights. Yep. Really bright for, I shoot shallow a lot, so yep. not, too, not too deep. Filters are the Cyan filters. These ones are the M1s, basically the perfect for like at least up to zero to 30 feet, basically, or sure. a little bit deeper even. So tell the folks at home that aren't familiar with these Cyan filters, what do they do? So when you manual white balance, when you manual white balance your camera, and you have, if you have lights that are just normal white light that you bring down, whether it be strobes or um, any external light that is a natural light, you, if with the white, with the manual white balance, if you don't use the lights, they, sh everything shows up blown up red, yep. or pink, or magenta, or whatever. Yep. And with the filters, it 
kind of it balances the red light from your strobes or from your light from your video light and it makes that look come out as then white so it white balances the video lights basically right or the strobes so basically what's happening is if you if you do a custom white balance without lights you get color all the way through your image right yeah if you custom white balance with these filters what you'll get is you'll get that normal white balance in the depth of the background mm -hmm. but when your subject gets closer it gets lit yeah but it Instead doesn't get redder but it doesn't get warmer yeah it just gets lit and that's the beauty of a cyan filter mm -hmm. and i'm so yeah. bummed because um we basically shoot the same lights i've got that the um the uh keldans and this is the modular version of your light but guess what hey keldan this don't fit you guys should hook us up we need some filters for these lights um same sort of um same sort of deal now when i'm shooting um these lights underwater because i'm not using the cyan filter what i actually have to do and this is a pretty good tip for you guys watching out there is um, I custom white balance my light to my camera. Now I know I've talked a lot about in this in, in our past videos but the importance of custom balancing your 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 camera to your light source is you it, it can't be um, over overstated. So the importance of it is um, getting the telling the camera the right temperature of the light that you're shooting underwater. And unfortunately, when I'm shooting with um, uh, video lights like these Keldans, they're very bright lights and they're high quality and they, they are the best on the market by any measure um, um, imaginable. But the problem that you get is when I balance the light, my camera to the light, if my subject is media away and the balance is perfect right there, as it gets closer, it gets warmer. If it gets farther away, it gets cooler. 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 So that's a something that I struggle with every day. Yeah. So I really wish I had a set of those. And um, as a matter of fact, I'm, after this interview, I'm going to go online and see if I can't find somebody who makes those because I'm, <laughs> I'm really a little bit jealous. But so, um, so you and I are shooting the same rigs. Basically, you're shooting a, uh, what, do you, what do you got here? Tell us about your rig. This one, this is the 1DX. Yep. And the 1DX as, oh, this, was, this one I have here is a Canon 1DX Mark II Two. with yeah. the 16 to 35 version 3 on and it. You, and you would say that's your A camera? That would be, it's like, can I have like A and a half? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I would shoot with the 1DX basically mainly non touch start to shoot more video. Yeah. And I also shoot, which have the option to shoot pretty good photos. Right. And I shoot with the 16 to 35 and the 8 to 15 yeah. fisheye. So I'm looking at your housing here, and um, that 16 to 35 is a massive long lens, and that extension for your dome port. I don't know if you guys can see this at home, but that uh, Naughty Cam housing is big anyway because that's a big body, yeah. and that extension for the dome port, you have to use that to fit this inside the port, right? You can't use that lens with any other port configuration. That's it. And I look at that thing, and I go, God, what a massive rig. Yeah. Um, it's impressive in size, but I bet it's a real hassle to free dive with that thing. Free diving, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a hassle free diving yeah. with it, basically. So generally, if I'm diving deep, like up and down, up and down all day, or especially like yeah. spear fishing or stuff or something like that, I put the 8 to 15 on, yeah. and that shrinks, that shrinks the, the extension port like, right. down to this, basically. And it's still, like, the body of the rig is still big, but I don't have that, the rest of this. Right. to worry about pulling sure. through the water. Now, you mentioned that you you have another camera, which is a 5D Mark IV Canon, which is the Canon camera that I shoot all the time. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, you have a separate housing for that? Yes. A whole complete different for configuration? Um, I would still use the same lights, the same arms and all that stuff. Um, I, changed, I interchanged the lenses between, that's, well, I got Canon lenses to interchange yeah. between both. So 16-35 on that, 8-15 on that. Yeah. If I'm shooting a macro 100 millimeter on that. Yeah. Uh, and it'll have the same dome and same extensions if necessary. Right. So everything. So, so Canon just released um, its new Micro Four Thirds crop sensor. What am I trying to say? Is it a Micro Four Thirds camera? EOS R? EOS R is a mirrorless. I'm not mirrorless. sure. Mirrorless. I don't know if it's Micro Four Thirds. I don't know if it's Micro Four Thirds. Um, somebody, you know what YouTube's like, man. There'll be some comments in the comment section all about this. I'm sure we, if we get it wrong, somebody will correct us. So anyway, the thing is with that camera is they changed the lens mount. Yeah. And that... Ah, it's killing me. Like I got so much invested in Canon glass, but I want to make the switch because basically that that EOS R is a 5D Mark IV. It's that's what it is with a better yeah. with a better uh, uh, motion codec. Yeah. Right? It so is. 
I had previously shot only one camera um, in that sort of in that sort of style, which was the Panasonic GH5. And I got to tell you, for those of you watching out there, like it was not my favorite camera. Um, I feel like I got sold a bill of goods, and I'm not going to talk about the major online retailer that told me how awesome this thing was when I bought it. Um, but they like went on and on and on about how this it, it does this incredible ambient uh, light ba- uh, white balance underwater, mm-hmm. and Mind you, it's convenient. It's a one-button white balance. And for guys like me and you, yeah. that's incredible, right? Because you gold. push one button, the camera's white balance, blah, blah, blah. But I found that I was really struggling with the ambient light white balance and mm-hmm. that the um, image would come out overly green all the time. Okay. But when I put it with my super expensive Keldan video lights and put the thing in auto mm-hmm. white balance, it was butter sexy. Nice. It was so smooth. But... I couldn't get that ambient light out of it. I couldn't get that ambient light white balance. It just didn't look right. It never, the colors were never right, and it certainly did not touch Canon color. Yeah. But you had a, you shot a, a GH4, GH4, right? Yeah. And what did you think about the camera? Um, for the GH4, for video, I think everybody would have known the GH4 isn't the best in low light. So for me, I noticed a lot um, when I just shoot, if it's an overcast day, I would notice some grain, even if I have the ISO to the lowest, everything's yeah. nice and sharp. I would notice some grain in like, like if I shoot a shipwreck, for example, I would notice right. some grain in, the, in those areas. Um, for the white balance, something I noticed was if I white balance it, Often I got like a really magenta hue to it, yeah. like whenever I white balance it, depending on the depth or how deep I go, and didn't really didn't really look good to me basically. Right. And I like I, especially using the GH4 and the Canon 5D Mark IV. The Canon 5D Mark IV, not for video, but for stills. I shot some video with the Mark IV also, and I noticed just how smooth the colors just like roll off yeah. each other basically, and I. The white balance is long. It's a longer process, of course, for right. the white balance instead of the GH4 one button thing. But it was just so much clean, like side by side cleaner. I was, I let my one of my friends. He was shooting the GH4 one day. I was shooting the 5D, and we were working on the video together. And I was side by side, like color correcting the video. And I was just like, wow. I wish this whole thing was just shot with the Canon, basically. Right. Just yeah, because there, it's, of the it's little bit day, of details, right? basically. Yeah, I mean, when you, it's, and it's funny that you mentioned that because on, on its own, if you see it on its own, people mm-hmm. would look at it and go, yeah, it's a pretty good video. But when you put it next to next something one of the 5D Mark IV or the yeah. 1D X2, um, or, or even a 5D Mark, 5D Mark II Canon, which does yeah. great underwater video. It was their first uh, uh, DSLR video in the 5D series. Mm-hmm. Um, I shot a lot of video on that, but um, the color even in that Mark II comes out so nice. Yeah. And then you know, I, I got to tell you, I was so disappointed with the GH5, and I didn't. I'm 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 the kind of guy that jumps in with both feet too, man. I, I went out and bought the macro lenses. I bought the yeah. wide lenses. I bought the macro port. I bought the wide port. I bought that. That they sold it. I bought it. Right. Yeah. I decked it out, dude, and I had to sell that thing. I had to get rid of it. But um, anyway, I'm on now. Back to my Canon line, and you and I were talking about this on the boat the other day. I feel like um, I'm pretty much here to stay, um, especially still wise. I think if I were to make a diff, make a jump forward into video, I might go with a pro level camera. But mm-hmm. from what I'm doing right now, my 5D Mark IV does everything that I need. And you're shooting that 1DX2, and I love that camera. But there's something about it that I can't wrap my head around, and I'm waiting for the three to come out. Yeah. And I think that's my next step. And and the thing with it is, is when I graduated from so this is my B camera, my 5D Mark III. Mm-hmm. So I'm a big fan of this camera as well. Now it doesn't do 4K, so that's really why I jumped into the 5D Mark IV. Yeah. And I have been so happy with the 5D Mark IV, but the difference between the two is one does 4K, mm-hmm. and, and the other one's obviously 1920, 1080. Uh, but my 5D Mark IV is a, what is it, 30, meg- 30 megapixels? I think mean, so is 30, yeah. 29 point something or 30 um, you megapixels? Have right, you have to have the right card to read that also. Right. And, but the three is a 22 or 23, I can't remember. Somebody, will, I'm sure, will correct me. But the thing that bothers me about the 1DX2 mm-hmm. is it's like a 23 megapixel camera. Or is it less than that? It's, 20. I think it's 20, like 20.4. Yeah, it's, it's kind of low, so. right? Yeah. And in the past, I would have never given that a second thought because mm-hmm. I was so happy with my three. But when I graduated from the three to the four and I had that extra nine megapixels, whatever it is, yeah. whatever the difference is, it was noticeable. So um, 
Anyway, so when I graduated from my uh, th- from my three to my four, I noticed the difference. And mm-hmm. in images side by side, especially sharpness in the in the highlights, sharpness in the in the shadows. Yeah. Between the four and the three was night and day. So that's what scares me about the One DX2. Now, what I do love about that camera is. A, that massive freaking battery that you showed me earlier. The thing looks like it's going to go for days on a battery. (laughs) But um, the other thing is, is it shoots um, 60p at 4K, right? Yeah. And I can't get that out of my Mark IV. And that's what it, that's, that's like almost the only reason why why I got it. Basically, the combination of it being the Canon for the colors. Yep. And 4K 60. Yep. And also me already having another Canon lens. So I was just able to interchange the lenses. I don't have to worry about buying a whole new lens. And what I was saying about the the GH4 earlier was the the metabone, like the speed adapter. Yep. I don't know any housings that accommodate those. Right, because like that, that, that adds like an that inch, adds, yeah. right? So I don't, I don't know if maybe, I never tried to know that I look, really look into it. I don't know if you have to buy like a, the smallest extension just to cover that. I don't know how that right. would affect anything. But I didn't go like that deep into it. So I just tried to stick with Canon right. to interchange with any other camera generally I would get, which is which was this one. Sure, and and for you guys at home that are looking at a new camera system right now, that EOS R is a really attractive system, and specifically if you don't already own all of this stuff. If you if once you get into the into the business and you own, you know, different um, dome ports, port extensions, um, lenses, making that switch becomes expensive. Yeah. Um, but if you're just getting into the into the uh, underwater photography now, I think that that EOS R is a great um, system to get into because it's just going to get better from here on out. You know, Sony's really kind of dominating right now with that uh, mirrorless technology, and um, I would say Panasonic's in there as well. But I just kind of crapped all over their GH5, and I'm not a huge fan of it, so I'm not going to talk any more about those guys. But um, the thing with the um, with the uh, trying to, let me try to land this plane. The mm-hmm. thing that you were talking about with that Metabones adapter, that's the scary part, right? Because you can use that 815 L series zoom on that EOS R, right? Yeah. But you have to use the new Canon adapter. Yeah. And what Canon is telling us right now is that all their autofocus functionality, all the communication between the lens and the body, spot on. Okay. But you still have to use the adapter, adapter. because the lens mount on the body it's itself is different. different. So, you know, hey, what are you going to do? Yeah. So I think I'm going to stick with the uh, DSLR for a little while longer. And I'm really kind of excited about the 1DX3 whenever that thing's going to yeah, come out. Yeah, whenever it comes so, out. Yeah, I think I was on the Canon rumor site the other day, and they were talking about some sometime into 2019. Yeah, it's something about the Olympics, because I did, when I was um, researching if I should get it now or not, because what yeah. happened to me with the GH4 is I got the GH4, and I feel like just a few months after GH5 dropped, it was, I was just like, devastated. I was like, no, <laughs> come on. Yeah. But same, like with the 1DX, I was like, I did research, yeah. like making sure if this is coming out anytime soon, right. I need to know. You need to Because it's, yeah. it's kind of a big deal. It is. It's a, it's a huge deal. It's yeah. a huge deal. But let's, let's go back and, and, and try to um, help some people out here that's watching this video. Now, the, he, here's the thing, guys. When you, when you, when you buy into one of these systems, um, you can grow with it. And that's the beauty of owning a DSLR and uh, a housing like this Naughty Cam or like the CNC that I shoot. Um, if Andre decides that he's going to graduate to the 1D3 when it comes out, 1DX3 when it comes out, he's still going to be able to shoot this port. He's still going to be able to shoot that extension tube, his arms, his strobes, his sync cords, all that stuff. It's going to work with his Naughty Cam housing. What's not going to work is if he changes bodies and goes to a mirrorless rig. Then he's going to have to get a new port system. He's going to have to get mm-hmm. new extension tubes. He's going to have to get a new everything, basically. Almost even new float arms, depending on the, the buoyancy of the mirrorless of system. Of course. Yeah. Now, let's, and let's, let's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's not something that I often talk about. And um, you've got some pretty big floats on this. It's a big housing. Yeah. It's a heavy camera. How have you got this set up in the water now? Um, so let's talk about with when you're free diving it, when you're not using video lights, when you're not using strobes, mm-hmm. the the housing with the sixteen thirty five, um, the eight inch port. Is that an eight inch port? This is um, ten inch. Just, I think that's the eight inch. Eight inch. Twenty so and thirty meg. It's um, big. Meters. So when you're diving that without the floats on it, what is it? Is it positive? Is it neutral? Is it negative? It is without anything on it. Just the sixteen and thirty five extension dome body. I think it's it's positive a little like a little Slightly. bit yeah yeah 
So I can let that go at 60 feet and it comes back up eventually. That's convenient. That's convenient. Yeah. That's, I, I have it. I mean, to me, I can't change anything basically with that. Right. That's like the minimal setup. Yeah. But to me, that's a big deal because if, if anything, I prefer to go down, like trying to pull it kind yeah. of. But if anything happens, whether it be extreme case blackout yeah, or yeah. I need to help somebody or I'm dealing with a shark or something, yeah. I can let that go and I know I can look for it at the surface instead of down the wall. Right. And now what he's talking about, guys, is he's talking about free diving. Yes. Um, it's a completely different life on scuba. So free diving these cameras, you're pushing them up and down. Things happen sometimes. And if you've got to let it go, it's nice to know that it's going to float. Yeah. You know where to look for it, right? And come back. <laughs> Mine also, uh, my CNC with my Canon 5D Mark IV, in this configuration, which is the 815 L-series lens, um, in this housing, this floats. Nice. Just. Nice. Um, I don't think I can float it from 60 feet. I think it would sink to the bottom at 60 feet. Mm. But at the surface, it will float. And that I actually let it go all the time on the surface, especially when we're yeah. free diving. I push it across the water to give it to someone else, or I'll yeah. let it go and do something and turn back around and pick it back up. So that's very nice. Now, when I rig it with uh, my for stroke photography, mm -hmm. um, it sinks like a stone. <laughs> And if I rig it with these Keldan lights, it's it gone. sinks like a stone. <laughs> yeah. So I'm shooting, um, I'll try not to make too much noise here on our, on our microphones here, but I'm shooting um, these YSD2 um, uh, CNC strobes. And for those of you who are in the market for strobes, these YSD2 uh, strobes have a guide rating of 32. They're the brightest strobes on the market. they got a great recycle rate. And I love them. If I use the same strobes. If yeah. you're into underwater photography yeah. with strobe flash, these are the ones to get. I am not a huge strobe flash guy, but sometimes I like to uh, shoot them and, and um, just fill in shadows. I don't usually shoot them in the way typically most people will shoot strobes. I just like to fill in the shadows with them. But as you can see on my rig, I've got these uh, beneath the surface uh, floats. They're, so they're less expensive than this carbon fiber naughty cam float, but they do the same job. And as you can see, I've got this configured with my um, dive computer on it. And this is a little trick that you guys might want to try at home. Um, when you're diving, especially when you're behind a very complicated DSLR rig, um, oftentimes I'm diving on, on scooters, on yeah. one of my Divex scooters. Um, I got my hands full, you know, and to take a second to look at my depth and time and no decompression limit, or if I'm free diving, my depth and time and how long I've been down there, yeah. it's kind of a hassle, right? So it's nice, little pro tip right here, guys. I've got my computer mounted on my camera. I'm already looking at my camera, so I just have to glance over to look at my computer. So anyway, there's that. But um, you can see I also have um, some, met some metallic uh, floats on here. And this is just enough to make it, it's negative. I said earlier it sinks like a stone. It sinks pretty, it, it'd go to the bottom if I let go of it. But um, um, I, I really like those, are they carbon fiber really, or are they just painted like that? No, these are carbon fiber. Yeah. And I only, I only use these ones with, Video lights, right? Because these these countdown video lights are heavy. They're right? heavy because there's a really huge, heavy. There's a huge um, li on battery inside these things. Yeah. And um, as as expensive as these are, you do not want to lose one of these. <laughs> so um, yeah, the floats they help out tremendously. Yeah. Now trimming your rig can be um, personal preference too. Yeah. Like I like to have mine, especially on scuba, slightly negative. Okay. I don't want it super heavy because what happens in. De uh, um, Inevitably, is you're in the water column, let's say your fins are down and your head's up and you're trying to take a shot of, you know, this coral reef scene or you've got a turtle or a shark swimming by or something and you're in a position where you can't be head down. Mm -hmm. If your rig is a little bit heavy, it'll pull you down, you know, and, yeah. and that's and you have to fight then to try to maintain it. And if you're trying to shoot video while you've got your rig a little bit too heavy, you're going to constantly fight and you're not going to get that butter smooth video because you're, kind of, you're trying to kick or skull to keep yourself up. So it's important, especially for you video shooters out there. Trim your rig. Um, get it, you know, not get it pretty close to neutral. You know, it doesn't have to be positive. It doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be neutral. Just it's personal preference. Get it to a point where you feel comfortable with handling it underwater, mm -hmm. so that it's not dominating your position in the water column. And that's all about using the floats, uh, the big ones, the little ones. Put them where you can. You can even put weights inside the housing if that's should you choose to do so. I know a lot of the. Um, a lot of the uh, cheaper cameras come with weights yeah. actually stuck to the bottom of the camera housing. Some people even put the weights on the dome, on or right on the dome yeah. cover, yeah. like these little pellets. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen that too. I always thought it would cool, be cool if you could just let your whole rig, lit lights and all, just kind of go and it just would hang right there perfectly upright. Yeah, but I I'm, saw one picture like that. Yeah. I don't know how, I mean, I'm st honestly, I'm still trying to get that, yeah. but my dome, with always shooting a big dome, that dome ends up going up, basically. Yeah. yeah. So. 
And I, I prefer not to, just for that, I prefer not to add more weight. Right. Like, because that would affect everything else that I right. can't change. But I'm okay for now. Yeah. yeah. It's comfortable. So I want to talk a little bit about settings because, um, I don't, you know, I say that you and I come from a similar background. And um, what I mean when I say that is that we're both video shooters. Mm -hmm. And to shoot great underwater video, you have to have a really firm understanding of ambient light, white balance. Um, there is, there's just... There's just no other way of doing it, right? Yeah. You got to color, you got to color your video underwater. You got to tell your camera what the color of light it is that you're using, and then go from there. So when you move into from video into stills, you bring that knowledge with the same you. Same thing. Yeah. And I think it makes you a way better photographer having done all that mm -hmm. video work because you have a you when you have an understanding of the blue of the color of the water surrounding you. And I think where most underwater photographers get it wrong in that is that they they use strobe photography underwater and inevitably what your underwater photo instructor teaches nine times out of ten and i'm going to be wrong here i'm part of this but nine times out of ten it's a high shutter speed yeah it's a fairly high f-stop and you know somewhere in the middle of the range um, iso but that high shutter speed so one two hundredth of a second um, what that does is that opens and closes so quickly that none of the ambient light actually reaches the sensor so all you're basically seeing is the strobe light on your subject so you get this dark blue background and this really lit foreground and some people love that yeah. and I always refer to it as like the scuba magazine look yeah. and I just don't like it man I just think it's an archaic way of shooting mm -hmm. and um, I would much rather see a reef scene that's not overblown out or oversaturated in color because when I'm diving that's what it looks like yeah right that's how you see it and um, and we, we, we achieve that look through, through, different, through different means. Now, obviously, when you put light back into the equation and um, once you color balance your camera to light, you get a completely different look, right? Yeah. Um, but for me, I love the ambient light still photograph. Um, I, I'm going to say something that sounds completely counterintuitive here as well. Okay. I don't mind having poppy colorful video. I don't mind it. I just don't want my stills to be poppy colorful. Yeah. Does that sound weird? Kind of. It does, right? It's kind of a... But, it's just, I guess it's personal preference. Yeah. But when I shoot a still, I want, one, I want people to go, wow, that's freaking incredible. Mm -hmm. But two, I want to, I want to show them what I'm actually seeing underwater. And for me, this has always been my thing. And, um, you know, I'm very passionate about our underwater marine environment. And I've said it a gazillion times. As a dive instructor, I can only take a few people diving and show them this world. Yeah. But as a photographer, I can share with the planet the delicate nature of our underwater environment with the hopes that they're going to want to sort of try to take care of it, right? Exactly. And the way you do that is by producing badass images, right? Pe images that make people think, make people speak, make people share them. Mm -hmm. And um, social media platforms like Instagram are a great place to do that. Yeah. Now, um, for me, I like to, um, and we'll talk, about, we'll talk about some camera settings here, but um, ambient light photography is sort of becoming a thing. Yeah. And I think it's making, it, it's making, I wouldn't say making a comeback because I don't think it was ever a real huge thing. Yeah, I don't um, think so either. It, but I, but I, I see now, and, I, and maybe, it's, maybe it's people are just turning on to it. Maybe it's now the camera's sensors are better and they're, they're able to capture what we see underwater without all that unnecessary artificial light. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, um, it's pretty easily achievable. And I typically will shoot, I've got um, some other videos on it, but I use these jumping off points, these baseline settings that I call them. Okay. And I'm usually somewhere around F11 at 1 125th, um, depending on how much light's in the water. Yeah. And I like to keep my ISO as near its native range as possible. So I like to shoot at ISO 100 because I like that butter smooth yeah. blue background with no real grain in it. Yeah. Like, so I like to do that. So typically what I'll, I'm somewhere around there and I'll adjust my f-stop up or down. I'll stop the camera up or down based on where my ISO is. Okay. If I can get it to 100 and I've got to go all the way down to f4, so be it. I'm shooting an 815L series. Mm -hmm. It ain't a big deal, mm -hmm. right? I can open that lens right up and, 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 get that, um, and get that look that I'm trying to achieve. And it, again, it's always based on an ambient light color balance. Yeah. You know, it's I carry a white slate on my um, BCD. I expose it to the sun just like so. I shoot it off to the races. Is that your process? Um, generally, it's just the same for me. I generally always use the sun because I always have sun yeah. to shoot. If not, if I'm like over in the blue or it just sounds like pretty too deep that I don't actually want to dive. Like I'm usually free diving. I'm usually 
shooting free diving. Yeah. So I would take a photo of my hand. Yeah. Like really, really, really close of the palm of my hand, not this side. Yeah. yeah. I won't come up. <laughs> but uh, I would do that, and generally, I I may I generally just do it at least once, and it comes out yeah. exactly how I need it to come out, basically. Right. And I don't really have to do much if I'm editing the video afterwards. I don't have to do much correction and post. Right. It's basically just um, increasing or decreasing the saturation yeah. and adjusting the exposure. And that's kind of that's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, and 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 I think it's an important point to make in that when you're shooting these stills um, underwater, you want the sand white. Yeah. When you're when I'm editing a still and there's sand in it and there's sand in 99.9 percent of all of my images. Um, I make I try to balance the camera or balance the the if I have to do anything in post I'm trying mm. to make that sand white. Yeah. I'm trying to make the sand white and I'm trying to make the color the blue color the right color of our water not oversaturated not you know poppy blue but the way that we actually see it underwater. And um that's very achievable with an ambient light color balance. Yeah it is. Now um I said I touched on this a little bit earlier about shooting near your camera's native ISO range mm -hmm. and I don't always do that because we do shoot a lot of um, tarpon here on Cayman because yeah. we've got a lot of silver sides, a lot of tarpon. Silver rush is one of my favorite times of year. We get all these dwarf, or these juvenile dwarf herring mm -hmm. that come in. They come in by the millions and they, they're, they're a polarizing fish. So they all move together at the same time and we get just tons of them all in the reefs and the wrecks and the overhangs off the, sh off the shallow walls. We just get these big balls of them yeah, and nice. these tarpon run through there, right? And they're gobbling up all these silver sides. And, I don't know if anybody of you guys out there watching this video have ever shot a tarpon with a strobe, but <laughs> it's like shooting a mirror, Yeah. right? So it's not a good option. I had, I had a similar instance shooting, um, I don't know if you guys get African pompano. Yeah, not it. a lot, not like you have in the Bahamas, yeah. but we do have some. We, um, African pompano, and they come through, my strobes go off. <laughs> Yeah, you can't because shoot them, right? They, they're literally like a mirror. They're like this this wide and it's all just yeah. complete silver. So if I have anything else that's to focus, my strobes go off. Yeah, I and could I just fix use my whatever else. I could around. fix my hair in this if I had hair in one of those African pompanos, right? You can see yourself in a reflection. <laughs> yeah, so to your to your point, yeah, the strobes go off and um, when we're shooting when I'm shooting those silver sides and those tarpons, it's usually um, in a cave, yeah. in an overhang in a ledge where it's dark. So I will shoot my Canon 5D Mark IV up to about 6,000 ISO. And mm -hmm. you know, it's, if, if you really blow it up, it gets a little bit noisy. Yeah. But for the most part, it's, they're good clear images. Matter of fact, I just had an image uh, posted yesterday in National Geographic yeah. from the Your Shot site. And that's one of those tarpon shots from inside a tunnel. It's a high ISO shot. I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly off the top of my head what it was, but it wasn't 100. Yeah. Um, it was up there pretty good. But, Point being, you get a good camera, you can jack the ISO up quite a bit, um, but it'd be my recommendation to everybody watching that you keep it as low as you possibly can, keep it near its native range. That's gonna be its highest performance level. Now, um, shooting, um, shooting with these, uh, these video lights, is, do you ever use them as still lights or shoot, for shooting stills, or do you just primarily use them for shooting video? Um, primarily just for video. Yeah. Like, if I'm using, if it's ever the instance I would be shooting, like I kind of think I would use both. I'll take like photo and video the yeah. same day. I would prioritize what I want to accomplish that day. So if it's video, I'll generally keep them on. But if I'm free diving and I know it's like a lot of running up and down, well, swimming up and down, like following animals or strong current or big waves, anything like that, generally I would take them off because they are pretty big hassle to pull through the water, yeah. especially with this entire rig right here. Um, and I'll shoot ambient light, yeah. Dep depending on the subject. But, right. but usually for me, it's a it's an option where I can do without strobes, and you don't. It's not like it's not a big difference at right. all. But it would be for if I do, it would be for that added detail, and yeah, basically. Right. Well, I, what I like to do now at this point during our video is I just want to pull up a few of your um, images, and okay. if we could, I want to play a little game here. And I want to try to guess, and I, you may not even remember what settings that you had. I but probably you, don't. But you might, you might know. I want to try to guess what your camera settings were. Okay. And we can see if I'm close or spot on Based or just on what I remember. way out of the freaking park. Okay. So uh, the first image we want to pull up is this. I love this shot. It's this nurse shark, and you've got this model diving down in the background. And the thing that stands out to me most about the image is, A, you got the, color, the, the watercolor right. Yeah. Not too that's many people favorite. get the watercolor right, man. So straight away I look at that and I go, yeah, man, that's a good shot. But what I really like about it is the symmetry of the image. Mm -hmm. And I will typically shoot my cameras on the single center dot focal point. 
Okay. Um, I find that if I use one of the larger groupings, mm -hmm. that sometimes, especially if I pull, the, if I stop the camera um, to f4, mm -hmm. and I, it, it might pick up like surface water, or it might pick up something over here, it might pick up something over there, and my subject is soft. Mm -hmm. So I like using that single point. I don't know how you shoot, but for me, I like to do that. And it's challenging sometimes, especially with an image like that, where um, where you don't get where your subject's not in the center of the image. Yeah. But you know, I I'll typically shoot where I can crop it. And I, I it generally right. use for the focus points. I generally use the um, the nine square. Um, yeah. I, I don't know the actual. I can't remember the actual name of it. But the nine square one, I can move. I can move anywhere basically. Right. Where because most of um, I'd usually have like two subjects, so it'd be like an animal and a person or well, that's, that's generally what it is or what I try to do. Yeah. I want, if that animal is moving, I want to be able to do that. And also sometimes free diving, if it's sharks, my focus isn't 100% always on the camera because I need to actually look around every right. now and again. So I'll be able to, if I look away for a second, I know I'll be able to shoot where that little, I don't have to worry about the, the one focus point right. on the camera. And I can still like glance to my left. I know it's okay, keep on shooting. And uh, generally, it would, right. it would not, the composition wouldn't move and the animal wouldn't move too far out of the focus points. Right. And I generally need it all the time. So tell me about this image. Let me, I'm going to guess at it, right? I'm going to take a shot at this thing. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember um, how, what your settings were on this, but I'm guessing that that, first of all, first of all that's your, that's a 1635, right? That is an 8 to 15. Boom, wrong on the first one. Um, <laughs> Was, I'm guessing it's somewhere around, I don't know, F8 at 1 125th or 1 100th, probably an auto ISO setting or something. That was, I think that day was super bright. Yeah. So, and it was pretty shallow and the reflection from that sound was pretty bright. I think my F stop was at 11. Yeah. Yeah. And shutter probably was at, probably at 200. Yeah. And ISO is probably two two hundred also. So I was dead wrong on all that. <laughs> <laughs> My intuitive camera sleuthing abilities aren't as good as I thought they were. So tell tell us about this image because I, I I really dig it. I, did, I love the symmetry. I love the color. I love everything about it. Tell me about it. So this particular image was actually a mistake. Oh wow! <laughs> to be truthfully honest with you, that that image was shot on the way down for an image that I that we had in mind. Sabine and I was Sabine um was the model in that photo. Yeah. And she was going as she was going down, I was down before I was about fifteen feet of water somewhere in the Exuma in the Bahamas. And she was going down and I was down there already. I was just kinda like looking around waiting for her to get in position because I needed we needed the shark to move initially yeah. so I know the shark would have swum into towards me. So as she was getting into position, I just did a test shot just to see like the composition, the lighting yeah. and all that stuff. Did it probably like three more test shots. And then I went and then the shark moved, got into position for the got into position for the photo that we wanted. The photo that I wanted didn't turn out the way I wanted it. Right. And we tried it a few more times, but it was like it was okay. And then when I was scrolling through the raw images after we went back, I saw this and I was just like, oh, this is cool. Like the composition for the third is like almost like perfect. So yeah. I was just like, yeah, it's okay. So I didn't like, I put it there like as Mark, but I didn't, I wasn't like, this is a shot. Right. I went on to some other stuff. I edited the, some of the other photos and it's probably until like maybe like thir two or I think it was like two months afterwards, I was going through some more photos to look yeah. again, I need some photos to edit. And Sabine was asking me about some photos. Do we have any more photos from this day? And I sent, I sent her like a few options. She said, why don't you use this? And I think this is, this is perfect. And I was just like, eh. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it, it seems so literally composed. I, yeah. was, I was like, yeah, it's, it's, re it's really good for that. Yeah. But I know that was initially because it wasn't the shot that I was going for. Right. But when I actually, I started to edit it, I started to look into it more and I noticed like the little details, like, like for example, the ripples at the, on the bottom on the sun and the yeah. ripples at the surface because it was kind of like in a marina. Yeah. So it was glass flat. The, the nurse shark was right there. It looks a little bit bigger yeah. than her. So it gives that like illusion that the shark is a lot bigger. Yeah, yeah. And Sabine's like almost like in a perfect position to come down with her, with her 
legs and with the arms with and her the arms stuff. extended back that's yeah. the thing i think one of the things that stood out to me as well was her position in the water and um it can be shooting underwater models is mm-hmm. all about timing right and it's this i wanted to touch on this earlier and, and I, i'm glad that we were talking about this image because it brings me back to it mm-hmm. um you and i both shoot in high speed continuous yeah right and um i think i'm at seven frames a second i think i'm the mark four and you're at 12 on the um, 14. 14. And that, that photo is with the Mark IV. That's the Mark IV yeah, photo. So was, seven frames a second. Yeah. So so it, that's one of the other advantages to our ambient light photography. There are many advantages to ambient light photography, yeah. but let's get back to that one because this, is a, this, this, well, this one's really worth talking about. Mm-hmm. When you're shooting that high-speed continuous, um, guys, you know, you're, the, if your subject is here and you're here, the image before it might not be perfect and the image after it might, might not be perfect, but because you're shooting so many, you're gonna get that right image. So it's, I think it's important, especially when shooting ambient light, as you shoot at your maximum frame rate. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't always do that with um, strobe lighting because no. you've got a recycle rate on your strobes. And yeah. if you're really shooting them like hard, you're gonna get about two shots and they're gonna have to recycle and then you'll get two shots in a recycle. So you'll get a lot of lit images, a lot of dark images, lit images, dark images. Yep. So um, it's another advantage of shooting it's kind uh, of, yeah, ambient light, right? For me, it's kind of a, it's kind of a nuisance because, like, for example, using the Mark IV, it would be like if I'm using like a high, like 16 um, guide number on my strobes, yeah. and I'm shooting, I probably get like four out of seven or three out of seven photos that are properly lit because of the, the recycle time, yeah, yeah. and just can't have that, especially yeah. when like it's dark yeah. or a white balance is like slightly different yeah and you miss that one shot because the strobe didn't focus but yeah. everything else is perfect and you can't it's use super it super frustrating yeah been been there done that <laughs> i go going back to those strobes i know that um i don't know i can't remember if we touched on it earlier but when i shoot um my flash photography underwater i am not i am basically shooting it to add color to add light to the shadows that's mm-hmm. it i'm not trying to light the whole reef scene I'm not trying to, um, and, and you'll also notice, and most of the time, if anybody sees me shooting strobes underwater, I'll have one on top of the port and one under the port, and they're stuck in tight mm-hmm. to the camera at a slight angle, so I'm not picking up that turbidity or backscatter yeah. in the water. But I'm trying to light something very specific. I'm not trying to s- extend them way out and blow the whole reef scene out. Mm-hmm. So um, I shoot them a little bit differently that way, that way as well. So let's go through a couple more of your images there, and. Um, you know, in the Bahamas, like here in Cayman, like so, we're known for vertical walls. We're known for the Kitty Wake wreck, which I'm yeah. in love with. I shoot it all the time. Yeah. And um, Stingray City, of but we course. don't have a lot of sharks, man. What's up with that? I mean, I, can, I mean, I know why it is, but you stole them. You stole them, man. Like so, we just got back from from Freeport, and we spent some time over there um, in Tiger Beach. Mm-hmm. And for those of you who don't know anything about Tiger Beach, it ain't a beach. <laughs> it's um, it's a hell of a long ride offshore, and um, in some pretty challenging conditions. But um, I got to tell you, man, I fell in love with it. And the cool thing about me living in Cayman is there's a BA flight, man, like three yeah. times a week. Right there. And it's cheap, and I can go right to your hometown and jump off of that airplane and go diving. So this is like in my wheelhouse now, and I'm, yeah. it's on my radar. And um, I'm going back. Um, in a couple of weeks to do hammerheads and bull sharks in Bimini. So yeah. I am super excited Sweet. about that. But um, you shoot a lot of sharks and um, mostly free diving. Yeah. So um, tell us about, let's, let's pull up one, another one of your images here and let me, ha- let me take a quick guess at, at what it is that, uh, that I'm looking at and maybe I, can, uh, maybe I can guess your settings. All right, so this next image that we're gonna pull up here is uh, an amazing image from some sort of underwater cave. I'm mm-hmm. not sure what you guys got going on over there. We don't have places like that here, so I'm super jealous. <laughs> but I love the image. And um, th- th- so he- here's, here's a little trick that I do sometimes. And in this image, it kind of reminds me of that. Mm-hmm. I like to shoot things in the shadows underwater. I love when the whole scene is lit, but then there's a, a dark area that creates a shadow. Because yeah. if you can get your subject in that shadow, you can create depth to your yeah. image that you couldn't create otherwise without that shadow. Yeah. And um, that's a trick that a lot of, uh, they, that they use on a lot of movie sets and shooting feature films. And a friend of mine taught me that ages ago. So sometimes what I'll do is um, I'll take my big dive boat, Juggernaut, and I'll hide um, the sun with the, with the dive boat like mm-hmm. over the top of the kitty wake and it'll cast a massive shadow that you can't really see yeah. until you put your subject in it. Yeah. And it gives it so much more depth to the image. And I feel like that's kind of what you did in this image. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about it. I call this one Salt Vagabond. Yeah. And 
and you can you could give a re- meaning to that name however you want. Yeah. But this image is shot in Thunderball Grotto in Exuma, Bahamas, and it's yeah. a place I've been a lot shooting frequently. And on this particular day, there's actually like late evening, sun was kind of going down already. It was about four o'clock or so, someone had sat around like six, yeah. so maybe like 4.30, almost, almost even five. Perfect time of day. <laughs> so just shoot in a cave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever the angle the light comes into that cave, that's yeah. the perfect time of day, right? Yeah. So we use, that's, that's usually what the time of day that we time it to go there, yeah. to go to Thunderball Grotto. But we shot some other stuff early in the day, and this is kind of the last spot we went to for this, for this trip. So we went in the cave, and this, this particular shot wasn't, like, preconceived at all. This was right. just, like, we were in the cave, you wear this, we're going to figure something out, basically. Like we've, and I, we've shot this, oh, I've shot this cave so many times from different angles, um, video, photos, models, no models. And I honestly went in there thinking, okay, I, don't, I like, really have no idea what to do. And so we tried some angles um, from different openings that I didn't shoot before. Those ones didn't really work out because because of the light, it was too dark. Right. And then we were kind of leaving out. And at this time, the day there were there were no tourists because late all the tor- tour boats would have gone. Yeah. Um, there was hardly any sun, which is different. But the good thing about it was tide was super high, so it flooded a lot of the cave more than what we usually see there. And with the tide, I think it was flowing back out. Yeah, the tide was flowing back out. I can't remember, out or in, but the visibility was perfect. Right. Like, super clean. It looked like you were diving in a spring when when you were actually there. And this shot, like, Sabine actually just, took, she took the initiative just to, she was like, watch this. And she just goes down, does this type of pose, or, like, just stands in the sun. I was just like, stay right there. Yeah. Stay right there. I swim, I swim to the back of the cave, I go down, get the composition where I see the light coming in and all that stuff, and I'm like, let's do this. I'm like, this is, this is the shot that we're gonna do today. So this shot was, we, t- we took like, I think it was like three dives, yeah. like three, and it's like, it's pretty shallow. It was like maybe nine feet, 10, nine, ten feet or right. so. And we, we go down, she goes down, I go down after her. She's wearing weights under the dress and all that stuff. And I'm shooting. I just shoot, shoot, shoot. She did, she kind of let with all, with all the current flowing into the cave. It makes perfect for her hair positioning. So her hair yeah. flows backwards. Um, the dress flows back, um, back, and all that stuff. And for like it, everything just worked. It almost worked perfectly, other than the light. Like I was shooting with the I shot with the Canon One DX Mark II. Yeah. I believe I was shooting. With the 60 and the 35? Yep. I, th- I think so. So I think you're at F5, 6, 1, 2000 ISO. That's pretty close, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty close. Yeah, yeah that's that pretty was, close. That was like, I don't usually bump up that high for the ISO, but you I had have to, no right? choice. I yeah, had yeah. no choice. So I think it was like, I honestly think exactly what you said were the settings yeah. for that one. So. So do you ever, um, I do this sometimes when I'm, if I'm chasing something that's, I always use the term downhill if the sun is over my shoulder okay. or uphill if I'm shooting into the sun. Okay. So I, I, I throw those terms out a lot. So I'll tell you now what I'm talking about. Good to know. So when I say it, you'll understand what I'm saying. But I, if, I, if, I'm move, if I'm shooting a uh, moving subject um, that's swimming around me a lot, I'll throw it in auto ISO. Do you ever do that? Um... Not really. Yeah. No, I don't think I've read. Just keep it down to the lowest I could. I, I, I usually keep it low as well, but when I find that I have to shoot into the sun or away from the sun quickly, mm-hmm. rather than trying to make those adjustments, if I feel like I've got the right f-stop and the right shutter speed, I've got the latitude to use that auto ISO, and sometimes mm-hmm. I find that handy um, if everything is right. Now, I never shoot video on auto ISO because, For, if, especially if you get in the dark areas, the yeah. camera will just go, Green. and, you know, 128,000 ISO and it's like yeah that's no no bueno yeah for the for video for the, like the transition between light to dark I would the most I do I switch to shutter priority yeah so I leave that in usually I'm shooting in 6 so I leave it at 125 right and everything else usually wouldn't the ISO usually wouldn't go like super high right but I don't want to have to 
dial that down while I'm shooting. Right. I want it to be completely smooth, coming like going in and out of a yeah. cave or a wreck. I want it to be smooth and only for video. Do right. But stills, almost, well, not almost, but just generally always manual all the time. Right. I'm always, I'm, I'm the same. I'm always in manual. And uh, now sh shooting topside, there are some factors that we don't ro really run into underwater. And one of them, I think, is rolling shutter because mm -hmm. I don't pan a lot. But mm -hmm. maybe you do. But I, when I'm shooting video, I'm usually very uh, direct and very measured in how I'm moving my camera. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have to worry about rolling shutter. So when, when you shoot topside, you always want to double your frame rate with your shutter speed. Yeah. And is that something that you do? I still practice that on no water. Yeah. You do? I leave it at... It's frame, 60 frames, 125, right. 50, um, 24 frames, 50. I have, as I've gotten a little bit older in my underwater video career, I've sort of strayed away from that a little bit. Okay. And I'll do whatever it takes to compose the light and everything properly, and I don't mm -hmm. worry too much about rolling shutter. But um, I know a lot of people, I think 180 degree shutter angle is what most people shoot. So yeah. it's not something that I do a lot. So let's move on to the next image. Um, I love that image, by the way. Um, I'm super jealous when I'm in, the, when I'm in Bahamas. Two weeks from now, maybe we can go visit that site. Yeah, I can get you a cave. So this next image is uh, looks like it's in a cave. Is it the same cave? Is it the same model? I got to tell you, before you tell me, I see a lot of guys trying to pull this thing off, like that mirror glass where you've got your model upside down and you flip it over and, and you know sort of flip the script. Yeah. You pull that. You pull that off. It's amazing. So Thanks, tell me about the image. Is it who's the girl in the image? Um, tell me about your camera settings. What's up? So this image also shot in Thunderball Grotto yep. in Exuma. Same model, Sabine. And the settings on this was around, so we were shooting at the, op at the surface, of course, yep. at the opening of one of the caves. So one of the caves, the opening was like right by my ankles, basically. It's a, it's a pretty big opening. Um, no strobes in this. And the tide was, it was like, between low and high tide. So yeah. there was there was hardly any movement in the cave. Right. And it was really flat and really nice and calm. So that's yeah. where you could get the, the glass reflection. Um, the settings in this were about, I think like 160, 160 I think like F-stop 5.6. Yeah. And ISO maybe at like 800 or a thousand yeah. because the, the light was like right right behind me basically so I, yeah. I, I was getting like almost enough light so there's a lot going on there now so b we, let's break it down for the for the folks at home so they understand why you use those settings so the 1 60th is fast enough to freeze her mm -hmm. in the water so she's drifting up toward the glassy water yeah so you want to catch that movement in the hair so you need a shutter fast enough to capture that without getting a lot of motion blur in the hair mm -hmm. um, was that your eight millimeter or was that your 1635 that was that was probably eight. I wasn't really shooting the so, sixteen. So probably your eight fifteen L series zoom. Yeah. And with that lens at five six, it's pretty shallow. But let's be honest, with that lens, I mean, you can shoot it at four and still get plenty of depth of field, yeah. right? So um, and I and eight hundred ISO on that Mark four, mm -hmm. or was that your? That was a Mark four. Yeah. Mark four eight hundred is still butter smooth. So. Yeah. Um, incredible image. I love it. And um, you know, here's the thing, like. Underwater photography is such a creative outlet, right? Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's such a great way to express your creativity. And I started shooting like this a few years ago, and obviously you've been doing it for a long time, trying to get those wow shots. Like people see these images that I shoot or that you shoot, and they go, oh my gosh, that's amazing. But they don't really understand the time that goes, goes into something into like that, right? Yeah. So tell us, like, you didn't just pop in that cave and take that picture, right? No. <laughs> so no, it was, no, no. there was a process involved, right? There was a long right? process, yeah. So you probably spent quite a bit of time in there and, and took, did several takes until yeah. you got the one that you wanted, right? So, like, for that shot, if I remember that day, we were probably in the cave. This was, like, coming down to the end. I was with a few of my other friends. Um, I can't remember if I shot anything with them. My, my, my other friend, David, he usually is, like, the guy in the photos that I shoot. I, shot, I might have shot something with him, and then they left. Um, my other friend left, and it was just to be, because I was, like, trying to shoot all of them, and the, the shots that we had in mind were pretty complex. So most of them I mean, might be upside down, or we were trying to time it with the tourists coming in and out of Thunderball yeah, Grotto. And this shot was kind of just like a, I think it was just like a 
like a random shot. Like I would, I would just try to swim around and just take different photos from different angles, and then yeah. try to picture someone here, and then think of the composition and all that stuff. So I realized that the surface was like smooth, like there right. was there was no movement, which is in this cave you notice it because you usually go there and it's high tide or low tide, and you're like kicking so hard just to stay inside the cave oh, wow. in one spot. So you either getting dragged out or getting pushed in and shooting that, especially like over-unders and stuff with like a heavy rig like this, especially if I, usually I wouldn't have any strobes or anything right. in there, but it's it's pretty difficult to do because you're Man. kicking you're kicking upright, but backwards at the same time with your model needing to kick into you. Yes, so of especially with an eight to 15 lens, if you're shooting a half and half, you don't want to catch your fins but you need to get it right there where the focus stays, where the model is or the yeah. subject is. And so for this one, no current, thank God. That's, a, that's a challenging nice shot, man, and it, yeah. and it came out gorgeous. And it's, it's funny when you talk about that because, you know, me being from Cayman, like doing most of my photography here, like our tidal change is like six inches. So when you start talking about tides moving, like, yeah. I mean, you guys, it's funny because when I was in the Bahamas, I was like, it was weird because I'm on an island, but I'm not in the Caribbean, and I spend my, my entire adult life in the Caribbean. So it was weird being in the Bahamas and then thinking, oh, I'm not in the Caribbean. It's kind of weird. But you guys are far enough north that you get those big tides. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a factor here, man. And it's uh, like it's really challenging, and it's, uh, it's something that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to create these images. For sure. Now, tell me about your process a little bit, um, because it, it, as an underwater photographer, you know, I know a lot of people that, that say, hey man, how did you get that image? I want to recreate that. But you're not about that, right? No. I, don't, I'm, I'm, I feel the same way. I don't want to recreate something that someone else has done. I want to make something new. Yeah, I want to make something, exactly that someone else hasn't, that ha something, that, something that someone hasn't done, something that speaks to people, something that moves people when they see the image, and something that's going to challenge me and my model. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I got to tell you, I find a lot of inspiration in Instagram. Not that I see something and I try to copy it, but I, I will see things on that platform um, from some amazing photographers, just like yourself. And I will, I'll, I'll look at those images and think, oh, that, that will give me, that will spark an imagination, a spark, spark something in me to say, hey, maybe I want to try this next time I'm out. Is that sort yeah. of how your process goes? Or talk, tell me um, more about that. For me, recently, I use Instagram sim similar to like that, but and most, most of the stuff I follow is obviously just pure on the water stuff. I try to use my Instagram just as like, kind of like a lookbook yeah. for, for what's, up, what's up to date, keeping up to date with people's stuff. And a lot of instances I use Instagram to see what is being put out there. So I know that any ideas that I might have come up without looking at inspiration or with inspiration, I'm not doing anything too similar or exact, almost exactly like right. it basically. So. For Instagram, generally, I, I kind of see a lot of that now where it'd be like really similar images and of course underwater. And to me, it's the the whole society of like underwater shooting and stuff is kind of, it's, it's already small. So to kind of copy or get too close to someone else's image and kind of do you the same it, right? thing, like you, you see it basically. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty big difference. So like... For example, like the free diving shots that you take, like with the composition and the lighting and all that stuff, you do, you, that's little things that you usually don't see yeah. around there. So those, those stuff kind of stand out from the usual. Um, but I actually get my inspiration from like comic books. Oh, wow. Like superhero space. I didn't superhero. see that coming at all. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where, and I'm, I'm a big superhero fan. So yeah. even, even without actually going and looking, I always have Batman, Superman, DC, comics, Marvel in my head. I love that, man. And I try to I try to use that and put those in my images. Yeah. Or I try to just find something that looks really strange where it actually stops the viewer and says, like, if you scroll in past Instagram, you stop and you scroll back up and you're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> and like you just you're trying to think like, what is this? And it's like, what's actually happening? And then you figure out and it could be pretty cool. I mean, I love that and. Um, it's funny that you, you just by you saying that, I mean, I, you've already sparked an idea in my head, man. Just like superheroes. I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to steal your shit, though. It's okay. Um, uh, so, but let's, let's, uh, let's move on just for a second. And because we're talking about Instagram. Okay. Um, 
This day and age with social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, um, are just a, two of the major ones, but there are, there are other ones that I use. I utilize the, um, the uh, Nat Geo Your Shot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I enjoy posting there, and like Instagram, I find a lot of inspiration in other professional photographers that also post on Your Shot. Mm -hmm. Do you post on any other platforms, or is Instagram your main one? Um, Instagram is definitely the main one. I also post on Facebook. I recently started the Nat Geo Your Shot thing. Yeah. I saw some some really good underwater images being featured there, and I was yeah. just like, and those are images that I say like deserve to be there, like, including yours, yeah. the recent one. Um, I started like on 500 pixels PX, or how yeah. do you pronounce it, and that's about it basically. Yeah, yeah. but I I'm trying to get more into submitting my photos around, right? Other than just Instagram, but mainly. Everything has just been Instagram and well, Facebook. Too. It's a strong platform, Instagram, and um, I utilize it often because um, it gives uh, ad agencies and people who need underwater photographers an easy way to reach out and find guys like yeah, us, right? Exactly. So it's I find it very important. And I think it's also helpful for the people watching this video to, you know, when you shoot, find, find pick a platform and, and and dedicate yourself to it. Because what will happen eventually is you'll build up a portfolio large enough that people can find you. They can they can explore your work and yeah. decide also whether or not they to, yeah decide yeah. whether they want to buy some buy one of your images, hire you for a photo shoot, or just come diving and hang out with you. Or you know who knows you yeah. know um, most of my photography work these days is coming from Instagram, which is oddly odd because I've only been on there for about a year, but I'm getting a lot of business off of that platform. So I really yes. appreciate it. I like the platform, and it's um, like I said earlier, I gain a lot of inspiration from it. Mm -hmm. So. We're going to sort of wrap it up now, but um, is there anything you want to add? Tell, tell the viewers about you specifically. Where can they find you? I know you, you're, you operate out of Nassau. Yeah. Uh, what's your Instagram handle? Uh, my Instagram handle is at Andre Musgrove, at, well, at Andre Musgrove on Instagram. You can also check out my website, www.andremusgrove.com. Uh, my YouTube is the same thing, Andre Musgrove. And I post my longer videos that I would have edited together on YouTube. And on, also on Facebook, it's the same thing. Just, just my name, Andrew Musgrove. Fantastic. Well, man, Easy to I find. tell you what, man, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you yeah, and too. diving with you. And I look forward to two weeks from now, Nassau, then Bimini, Hammerheads, Bull Sharks, hey, whatever, Caves, man, whatever else we can find over there. What, let's see. I appreciate you coming out, man. <laughs> Thanks for having Thanks me, Thanks for man. your time. Thank you, too. And uh, let's wrap this up. And uh, I guess we're on the boat tomorrow and do some more diving and take some more pics, right? On video. And video. Um, if you guys enjoyed the video, please make sure you like and subscribe. Follow me on Instagram. I'm Cayman Jason. This is the way I see it.